Got Sean Gaines. Troubles, whiteness, in the big two DC and Marvel comics. <clears throat> Someone who goes by Professor Latinx, of course. Just, just goofy. Goofy as fuck, man. It's just insane that, that this even has... Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's just picking the easiest thing, like DC and Marvel, and then saying, oh yeah... The people in here are victimizing me, so give me money. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what he has to say about Welcome this. Welcome to Professor Latinx podcast, and today on this sunny day here in Columbus, Ohio, I have Sean Gines, co-editor of Unstable Masks, Whiteness, and American Superhero Comics. Ugh. Sean is also PhD candidate in 20th Century American Literature and culture at Michigan State University. Sean. So if you go to Michigan State University, uh, you got shammed. <laughs> Sean, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Frederick. Sean, this book uh, that you co-edited with Martin Lund, um, who unfortunately can't be with us at this moment. I, I, I know he's across the pond, and the hour differences were a little bit difficult. Um, but you came up with this idea. Why? Why did you come up, you and Martin, come up with this idea? And, of course, dedicate a bunch of time and energy to pull it together. This Well, we thought we could grift the hell out of a bunch of really guilt-ridden white people who have a lot of money. And uh, that's, I mean, that's, if they were going to be honest about the response, I mean, that, that would be the most honest response. Um, you know, again, taking like one of the most visible spaces, Marvel comics and, uh, taking another trendy thing, whining about racism and jamming them together. Why not? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's an easy thing to do. It's like a really, really easy thing to do. Edited volume that really kind of interrogates whiteness. Yeah. Kind of a, a providential story because it sort of came out of nowhere for both of us. Um, Martin and I had been friends online for a while, um, and I was spending a few weeks in New York one summer. New York, um, I think back in 2016. So I sort of said, hey, let's meet up. We met at a coffee house, and I think after a few minutes of conversation, sort of became best buddies, and we're like... That's so why you got to go down and bully you guys like this at the coffee house in, in Minecraft. Oops. Just prevent them from, from coming up with just waste of paper and pulp like this. Together. Um, and we kind of both immediately came to the idea of talking about what we had each seen as an important lacuna in comic studies, especially around superheroes, and both of us mostly read superhero comic, which is, you know, there's a lot of great work going on on race um, and ethnicity yep. and gender and religion in comics, but they tended not to be looking at what we saw as the problem that was creating the need to look at race, which is whiteness. There, you hear that? Yeah, the problem is whiteness. The problem in this space, in and of itself, is whiteness. Um, wowzers. Uh, he, he, I mean, it, and I don't even know if they're going to try to tap dance around, like trying to convince you and scramble your brain and make you think that it's not you as a white person being in the space or being represented um, they're going to come up with some convoluted ridiculousness to get you to not notice that they're just literally talking about removing you from the space if you're white. We sort of either physically or just through like force of will or, you know, monetary or social influence. Spent a few months, you know, trying to figure out, OK, what would the you know, this be? And eventually, you know, got a great group of contributors. Um, you the, the introduction, or not the introduction, but the preface yourself, and we got uh, Noah Berlotsky, who's a somewhat well-known uh, media commentator, to write the um, the outgoing Otsky media commentator piece. And, uh, you know, really crappy that, that connection, this guy. So, Martin, for our our listeners, what is the takeaway from Unstable Masks? Um, so the takeaway really is that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. <laughs> you hear that? There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Whenever a lefty says that, like that, that right there, you know, um, that is usually uttered. That phraseology is usually uttered when the right or, you know, the center or really the non-left 
has already conceded or you know ceded ground to the left in some way. Um, they'll always say after that, like after they get their concessions, they'll always say, well, there's still a lot of work to be done. And that means that they're not done. They're not done, you know, just completely destroying you or undermining you. They're just not done ever. Um, with race and whiteness and comic studies and, and not just with, with superheroes, but, you know, the reason we started with superheroes is because, one, they're such a, a driver of the mainstream industry and obviously have moved into films and television and games and become, you know, essentially next to Star Wars, probably the most lucrative thing there is in media. Wow, yeah, he's just admitting lucrative. It's lucrative. It has a lot of influence. I've already, I mean, wow, he's being somewhat transparent, I guess, but maybe unintentionally. Um, like, he's letting a lot slip. Yeah, it's very lucrative. It's a big space. There's a lot of people in it. Um, you know, we can get a lot of money, influence, and power just whinging about stupid things that aren't real. Um, and so what we really wanted to do was highlight that um, whiteness is sort of the powerhouse behind the way that race is operating in comic studies, which, you know, it's not a particularly uh, novel comment to make. Um, a lot of the scholars that we cite in our introduction, which frames everything, you know, these are folks who are talking about whiteness um, and race in comics. But what we wanted to do was put the explicit emphasis on bringing the sort of multi-disciplinary um, interest in whiteness studies to comics and sort of start a comic. Disciplinary interest into whiteness studies into comics. So they're trying to just bring, I mean, they're, they're, this is, I mean, this doesn't stop at comics, right? They try to do this with almost every, they're, they're doing this with every space. I mean, pushing the old guard waspy dude out of any sort of subculture or hobby or any sort of, endeavor of any sort it's really that ideally can continue from here because i think they view whiteness like whiteness is like the guy who's actually gonna raise his hand and be like wait a minute you want multi-gendered pyro necrosexual what what do you want in, what do you want in the comics that sounds completely ham-fisted and stupid <laughs> you know like the 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 whiteness is going to be what's going to push back against the the subversion. Like you know, they're going to be the one that most likely to push back against it. Sean, whiteness uh, for our listeners, especially the ones that are excited about comics, have been reading comics since you know the day we were born, pretty much. Um, you know, in lots of ways, I think of you know, kind of superheroes as materialized, you know, embodiments of our kind of wish fulfillment fantasy. And what does that, that mean when the superheroes are predominantly white and made, created by white sort of men, right? What It means that we're badass, dude. That's what that means. And well, by the way, Stan Leibowitz, oy vey, um, you know, <laughs> what is the fantasy of white power in and through Americans? <laughs> so, OK, so a bunch of people of a certain faction uh, that's overrepresented in entertainment running groups like DC and Marvel. Uh, that's a manifestation of like white power fantasy. Really? Stan Leibowitz. Are you serious, dude? Superheroes mean in terms of how do you come away with that? I mean, I don't understand how you come away with that takeaway. Dreaming, daydreaming, and materializing those dreams. Does that make sense? Isn't, uh, isn't X-Men like a big allegory for uh, World War II and Magneto's supposed to be like Jewish? And If I'm not mistaken, isn't that, isn't that like a whole thing? Yeah, it does. And I mean, I think that it's an important question to ask because, you know, a lot of people end up reading comics or starting with comics because superheroes are this sort of exciting escape. Um, and that's something Ramsey Fawaz deals with in his um, book, The New Mutants, but sort of going in a different direction about queer fantasy and gendered it and body, and uh, body fantasy uh, and gender. Commie twinkle toed idiocy. For us, I think um, whiteness sticks. really, we don't want to necessarily say that you know, liking a white superhero or seeing yourself, you know, as a white child, you know, as, say, Superman, who's basically always white, um, is a problem. But what we do want to, yeah, you are. to say is that 
this idea that the superhero is the figure of justice and strength, um, the savior of the, the community, even of humanity sometimes, that this reinforces the larger powers of structure into which both white people and people of color are born. Systemic systems of structural, institutional, <laughs> I mean, like, so one of the things, I mean, one of, one of the things boomers can stop doing is like owning the libs and one of the things they can start doing, well, maybe it's too late, but they need to figure out ways to get these types of people out of academia and out of HR departments. Um, you know, it might have had to have been done like 30, 40 years ago. Again, like I was saying, it might be way the fuck too late, but that's one of the things that needed to be done, honestly, like to prevent all of this is guys like this being able to actually walk into a university and with a straight face utter this gobbledygook, this fucking academic fucking diuretic soup, okay? The fact that he can go in there with a straight face and say that and be met with multiple straight faces, you know, in response, uh, that's a huge fucking problem. Um, you know, so you're... Uh, a systemic problem, if you will. You're noting that, obviously... Um, you know, if a, a child of color is reading comics, it might be difficult for them to see themselves in Superman. It might give them the idea that... Oh, my lens! Yeah, who gives a fuck? You know, if there are no superheroes of color, then they aren't to be represented in the people who can save society. So that classic, you know, you can be anything you want to when you grow up doesn't really mean much to uh, a child. Okay, well, we should stop saying that to people anyway, because that's a really stupid lie. Or... I mean, you can be, you could be whatever you want to be within reason, within your skill level, within your background, and within how lucky you are. Like, let's be real with people from for a change. How about that? A Latinx child who's um... Latinx. Okay, that's a good time to glance at this. About one in four U.S. Hispanics have heard of Latinx, but just three percent actually use it. Young Hispanic women amongst the most likely to use the term because, of course, repeal the nineteenth. In my, uh, you know. I mean, no, that is that is a sex. That's what a sexist would say. That that's that's what I meant. Um, that's what a total sexist bigot would say. Women voting is totally epic. Okay. Um, Pan ethnic labels describing the U.S. population of people tracing their roots to Latin America and Spain have been introduced over the decades, rising and falling in popularity. So they're talking about Latinx, or no, sorry, Hispanic and Latino. That came out of the 70s and 90s, but in, like, the 2010s, Latinx came out. Um, and it's cool. They keep it real. It's used by some news and entertainment outlets, corporations, local governments, and universities to describe the nation's Hispanic population. So, to me, like, that's that's just straight up them admitting, like, yeah, the powers that be. This is This is how these, like, alien lizard people are deciding to dissect and pick apart the population, you know? Um, so if you want to be a servant of that slice of the population, uh, keep using terms like Latinx, I guess, and keep using people of color, and keep using multi-syllabic terms with the suffix ism, ist, or phobe to try to, like, shame, morally shame people out of telling the truth. Keep doing that if you want to keep serving, like, lizard pod people, essentially. However, for the population, it is meant to describe only 23% of U.S. adults who self-identify as Hispanic or Latino have heard of the term Latinx, and just 3% say they even use it to describe themselves, according to a nationally representative bilingual survey of U.S. Hispanic adults conducted in December 2019 by Pew Research. Base Pew Research? So the emergence of Latinx coincides with a global movement a global movement to introduce gender neutral nouns and pronouns into many languages whose grammar has traditionally used male or female constructions conjugate the verb or conjugate the nouns um yeah so yeah there's like genders for all the nouns and it changes the way the verb operates in the sentence so if you speak German or Spanish or you know Francais whatever the fuck that's something you gotta deal with so Maybe, yeah, maybe this a lot of this gender ideology stems out of these goofy ass, you know, these people that just, yeah, I mean, maybe they see gender as a way more important fixture in language because of this, you know, it could be.
Um, or it could just be that they're trying to fucking subvert everything. Um, why did added to a widely used English dictionary in 2018 reflecting its greater use amongst 3% of Latinx? Yeah, okay. So I guess, I don't know, we'll come back to this in a second, but they're probably trying to popularize this sort of thing. They're saying like, oh yeah, it's not prevalent, but wouldn't it be great if it was? Probably. Just trying to see their role models. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, that's great. So, okay, you and Martin talk in your introduction um, about a kind of uh, at once hey, sort of simultaneous assimilationist and separationist impulse in comics. What does that mean exactly for a kind of lay person? Lay <laughs> um, are we? I, I, I forget, are we talking about comics there, or are we talking about whiteness? Um, You're talking about white, whiteness, but yeah, I, I was thinking... I forgot, how, uh, how do we bulldoze all the white people? I mean, uh, interrogate our whiteness, right. Um, you know, what does that mean? Like, um, I, I don't know, we could take, you know, um, the Captain America figure, maybe, mm -hmm. um, or any... any Probably the most based superhero, I guess. I'm comic guessing, superhero yeah. figure, and... Uh, Batman or, you know, um, yeah. and, you know, what does it mean that somehow whiteness in and through comics at once kind of pushes toward assimilation of otherness and at the same time creates the very category of the up talk throughout everything that he's saying he knows he's making it up as he goes along he's like God, what kind of bullshit word salad can i string together so that we can continue to get funding and donors what yeah, up talk yeah. of otherness <laughs> yeah um, otherness i mean we want people like you to be othered because you're really really annoying and you're also very parasitic that's that's the thing I mean, when you look at the history of whiteness, and in Ugh. fact, historians have been doing historians. How does this offer any value together, to any, anyone? Have been or anything? doing a lot of the brunt of what we call whiteness studies, um, and and one of the sort of key type of study that they do is to look at how did X group come to be considered white or not white, which is really a question of how did X group become empowered or disempowered based on what you know, sometimes arbitrary factors Merit. Um, led them to be nope. considered white or colored or raced or... You know. No, probably from Western Europe within the past five centuries and uh, demonstrating some kind of, <laughs> I don't know, civilized nature. You know, ethnicized. First world. You um, know. So when we talk about assimilationist, you know, what we mean there basically is that um, both superheroes and whiteness play... A role in establishing power. Um, if, for example, in the early 20th century, certain Europeans who we might consider today are, you know, quote unquote white, for example, Italians, Slavs, um, and Jews. Uh, oh, I love this one. The Italians are not white, but Jews are. Okay, this is this is just brain scram continued brain scrambling nonsense where they just try to get you to n not, you know, they they don't want you knowing what it means to be white. They want to keep you guessing as to what that means so they can eat more easily confuse you um, by the, and get you granting all these premises about, well, it's not real, but at the same time, it's the apotheosis of evil. It's like they got to break it down before they can demonize it. It's classic cult behavior, right? Or cult tactics. The middle 20th century, these people were considered white, but several decades before, they were considered people of color. They were ethnics. Right, so within like, no, probably even less than that. And so within a generation, yeah. So it was Bants, but then within a, within a generation, everybody was, you know, Italians were considered white by uh, Irishmen who were considered white by, you know, Germans who were considered white by, you know what I mean? Like, within a generation, I guarantee you, just Bants, within a generation, more Bants, and then it's sort of like just light, light, light-hearted bands. <laughs> um, and the term for that in the scholarship is ethnic whites, but what we see over time is that because the fear by people in charge that these ethnic whites from Europe could sort of align themselves with other oppressed classes in the U.S., especially black folks, um, giving them the status of whiteness means that we don't have to worry as much about them joining with black folks because racial tension has been created um, by giving them whiteness. Um, 
And well, they prop these guys profit off of racial tension, so this is 100% projection on his part, right there. It's a sort of right a similar there. thing where we're talking about superheroes. Um, it's not a one to one correspondence, but you know, the role of the superhero is to protect justice and establish um, Order. safety in the community. And oftentimes, we see this playing out along the same kind of lines that whiteness and whiteness as assimilation plays out. Could you, dude? Yeah. So whiteness means order, basically, and we're so we're supposed to feel ashamed about that. That, in general, like a white enclave or a white sort of area, predominantly you know white area, is gonna value order and law. And <laughs> if someone of a disparate faction comes across and tries to fuck with someone's property or livelihood, well, we have a system for that. Uh, physical removal. Um, you know law and order so that he's just saying that's a white construct and that that's sort of like the superhero represents law and order and whiteness and that sort of thing and that all of that is bad i guess and <laughs> problematic or white supremacy i don't know like we'll get into it give us um our listeners a, an example of a superhero that comes to mind for you batman yeah i mean i think um oswaldo oyola does a great job in the first chapter of the book um, of sort of talking about how is this like Batman is a fascist white supremacist sort of stuff because he's he's like vigilante he's like a Zimmerman who like I don't know he's like this, he's like a Zimmerman in a bat suit this question of the superhero and whiteness and can the non-white character become a superhero like Captain America who has historically been white and who by virtue of their very name Captain America represents the United States. Um, well, why would, uh, yeah, but the question is, like, other than just to take over, just arbitrarily take, like they were saying, like, a lucrative space over, there's no reason for someone like that to want their own Captain America, really. There's there's no actual reason for them to want that other than just money, influence, and power, really. There's no cultural reason for a, a black Captain America. He's, ba I mean, he's somewhat admitting that right there, right? And he be a a black person. Um, What's the, yeah, heroism is whiteness. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Beholder. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Own it. Like they're saying, oh, these traits are white or white supremacy. You're, so you're saying that being heroic and sticking up for your community and law and order, you're saying that's whiteness and bad and needs to be problematized or deconstructed in some way. And I, I don't. So I think looking at Captain America is a pretty great example. Obviously, throughout the history of superhero comics, there have been other instances um, where creators and even fans have tried to race bend characters yeah. you know, to create it's always a, cringe. a black Superman in the form of a character named Steel. I mean, dude, like a black Goku would actually. Yeah, I would accept a black Goku, though. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, black Superman, though, that doesn't make any sense. Or black Batman. And why? This. Typically doesn't work out well. Sales typically drop for a series. Yeah. Um, uh, mostly racist readers revolt against the idea and simply <laughs> say, no, you know, we can have both. He's giving you every reason to delight in being called that by him, except for, well, you know, people getting banned off of various platforms. We all know there's a huge purge going on right now. It's a miracle that I'm even on DLive.tv slash Durst the Worst. Go check me out. Or if you're on DLive, check me out on Durst Streams on YouTube. Uh, but, yeah. Our white Superman and our non-white super, you know, hero who is... I mean, you want to be called, like, in, in a sense, you want to be called these names by people like this. In the sense, not not in the sense that you, you know what's coming next. I mean, if they do a write-up on you, you know that your, your online presence is kaput. But, you know, it's it, it's correct to be called these names by people like this. Is what I'm saying. Not Superman. Um, but for the most part, you know, there is this tendency to think in terms of the superhero figure always being being white. We we have essentially come to associate the most important superheroes over the past 70 plus years with white men. Yep. A lot of people will say, well, that just happens to be the case. And we want to say, well, that does happen to be the case, but there is a historical and power-based reason for why. 
And there's absolutely no reason. Okay, well, if there is a power-based reason, there's absolutely zero reason why we should upend that power structure at all. Like you have an absolute. You've had these people have not given an actual reason as to why, if said power structure even exists, why we should be uh, interested in upending said power structure. Like why, why on earth should you we have be a interested chapter in, that? in the book? Um, maybe you can share with the listeners a little bit of the work that this sort of deeper work that you did in that, in that chapter. Yeah. So that chapter uh, is based on Darwin Cook's DC, the new frontier, um, which was a kind of not our heroes or white, what nonsense. Uh, well, most of the, most of the superheroes are who uh, ate at least from my knowledge. I mean, I'm not an expert on this subject by any stretch, but um, you know, a fun retelling of uh, there's blade there's uh what's the guy that hangs out with cable who's like the dimension traveler i forgot the um, names the history of the dc universe if you take you know a kind of insider's uh approach to how did the justice league come about in you know 1960 what were the set of circumstances in a united states where superheroes existed that led to these superheroes <laughs> sort of becoming a unit that in the end of the the new frontiers um mini series you know is an agent of military imperialism um and so what i wanted to do because i really love that comic not only because darwin cook was an incredible artist but because the comic did a lot to sort of resuscitate the stories of characters who seem somewhat minor from the perspective of like a dc universe history uh, what is he talking about? It's all up talking. Um, so I, I don't. So I don't have any. It's like there's no conviction behind anything this dude has to say. Like in my mind, Martian Manhunter and John Henry, aka Steel, um, who I end up focusing on in this chapter. And the reason I did that is because, having you know reread that that um, miniseries shortly before um, we started this project, I realized how odd it was that. The story of Martian Manhunter especially seems so central to the story that's developing over the course of the late 1950s in that miniseries and then up into the creation of Justice League. So Martian Manhunter, you know, he's a Martian, he comes from Mars, he's brought from Earth. Um, his normal Martian form is terrifying to humans. You know, this is the 1950s, so... There's a lot of science fiction B movies about invaders from space, um, and there's great scenes where he's sort of hell yeah. So yeah, so uh, America's learning to fear aliens instead of love them, like when ET like Spielberg comes around. <laughs> Joking aside, uh, ET's I sort of goes to but it, but it's clearly like you know it's clearly pro immigration propaganda. But yeah, you just contrast it. You know, there's a contrast there. Yeah. The Martian be afraid of the Martian movies in the 1950s, as opposed to embrace the Martian movies, uh, in the eighties, nineties and today movie theater and sees humans, you know, screaming at, you know, at the sight of these horrifying aliens. And he thinks, well, how do I fit in? You know, how can I be a part of this society that I want so desperately to help? And his way of doing that is to, um, sort of transform himself into a very non, you know, nonchalant, typical white policeman and do police work. Um, on the other hand, there's the story of John Henry, who, um, you know, historically, if you're, if you're a fan of country music or, or African-American folk tales and folk songs, you've probably heard of John Henry. There's many versions of that story. Um, you know, he was uh, a freedman who was working on a railroad the railroad boss brings in a steam-powered yeah, machine to, you know, John take over the work Henry. of the workers, meaning that the laborers would be out of work. So what John Henry does in the folk tale is work harder than the machine until he beats the machine. But ultimately, because he worked so hard, he so is it, is this supposed to be their idea of how a Blake superhero might actually be compelling to more than like two hipsters in San Francisco or New York? Is this supposed to be what this is? Uh, I'm not. I'm not buying so, it. So interestingly, in Darwin Cooks, but I'm not really the audience for this kind of stuff. Sort of imagine. Like I have my Bugman sort of tendencies, but not like this. DC and Marvel is so paused, and and so is Star Wars. I mean, all of that stuff is so 
paused and transparently like leftist propaganda just all the time. I can't stand it, you know. At least with something like like anime or video games, like you know, a lot of the a lot of that stuff is pretty gay and everything, you know, which is epic. Being gay is totally epic and awesome. There's nothing wrong with being gay. But uh most of that stuff is pretty pretty on the gay side, so Okay, there's this black character, but it's but it's not like overtly pause, pause. You know, it's 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 overtly gay to, but the you know, your name Steel, who is sort of invented in the 1990s, and he's a Superman figure. He's as powerful as Superman, but how do we integrate him into the history of the DC universe? How- Anime is being infiltrated in Japan at the moment. Rest in peace, Weeb. So are they injecting like stupid Western style, like critical theory propaganda into the anime now? I can't imagine. I mean, there's a lot of creepy, cringe stuff in that genre already. Like, geesh. <laughs> you know, and there's some there's some gems in there. But from my experience, most anime is horrible. But the one thing it had going for it for a really long time is that it didn't have that stupid lefty crap in it. We so maybe, I mean, they're probably going to get it in there next. Figure out what his, you know, addition to the Justice League would have looked like. What I was interested in in my paper is that um, Cook doesn't try to sugarcoat history. He doesn't try to say, you know, obviously, you know, in the 1950s, um, race was hard, but there were a bunch of good whites who led John Henry join the Justice League and everything was, you know, fine and dandy. That's not what Cook does. He says, no, it was pretty racist. Um, And maybe he is playing into a bit of sort of post-race, today is better. Um, it's not something I necessarily talk about, but at least what he's saying is in the 1950s. Instead of there's a lot of work that needs to be done and you have to give us way more money so I can have more people. In the 60s, you know, race sucked. And if there was a black guy who was doing vigilante work, he was going to be killed by the KKK. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Yo, base. Um, so I wanted to juxtapose <laughs> these two stories of an alien's ability to fit into society by sort of becoming the perfect policeman versus this vigilante who strikes out at racial justice but is murdered for it um, at the hands of white supremacy and to show that what Cook is doing is... Re- so this is just more propaganda. They're wedging more propaganda to make stupid, credulous morons who don't look into things continue to believe that white supremacy is like the main threat to worry about. Like it's the penultimate boogeyman that they can sort of brainwash people with the envisioning the yet another encroachment into yet another space history of the dc universe but doing so in a way that pays very close attention to how whiteness assimilates martian manhunter and rejects um yeah rejects assimilate yeah steel that's right yeah that's right. assimilate Henry, bitch. exactly sort of assimilate bitch. allegorical to the whole yeah that's right question of who can be a superhero oh Those that's who assimilate great yeah bitch. i love that um you're the title Unstable Masks is an allusion to Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks. With this in mind, could we take another character like Cyborg um, or, I don't know, you you choose, Wolverine or, you know, Vision. Um, Wolverine's and Canadian, kind of isn't read he? them through. Dirty Canadians. A Fanonian kind of a psychological sort of Fanonian conceptual space. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we these could, guys. to be honest, um, psychoanalysis is not. And again, this is over oh, uh, <laughs> Latinx. Use of, they, they don't use it. Use of Latinx is not common practice, and the term's emergence has generated debate about its appropriateness in a gendered language like Spanish. Some critics point out you know, U.S. English speakers saying it nor is the Spanish language. Yep. It, it just doesn't make any sense, and people aren't going to use it because it's stupid, and it's concocted by, like, bougie people of a certain, I don't know, overlord, uh, hostile outgroup, sort of tribal affiliation, oy vey, I wonder who they could possibly be, uh, oy gewalt. Um, those are the people whinging and kvetching about Latinx and telling people that people should that we should use it. But yeah, it Young Hispanics age 18 to 29 are among the most likely to have heard of the term, about half, under half. Um, the older older people don't know about it. Um, who, who are the ones actually saying it? 
If someone likes to identify with or lean toward the Democratic Party, you're more likely to have heard of the lead tanks, of course. Um, yeah, so just under half of them, or like a quarter of them, are aware of it, but like the amount of people using it. Yeah, online popularity. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of people couch this rise in social justice leftist advocacy around here. This is around when that Gamergate admittedly kind of cringe thing started and then yeah it's been well it's been a decline ever since but yeah this you know this is how they wedge it in they insist on just like you using certain terminologies and then before you know it it's everywhere I feel so I wouldn't be comfortable doing it but I think that like like even even again even if regular everyday people are not using it right even even if even if it has to be sort of uh, or, or straight up astroturfed or faked or shoved into um, prominence or into like collective consciousness, the chapters st- that we you know, have, still don't for do example, it. like you said, there's a there's a chapter on vision that focuses mostly on his sort of desire to attain white masculine domesticity, and that's an interesting chapter Alpha. because it tracks vision across not just you know one single comic, but across multiple iterations and shows how different creators deal with this. And there's a lot going on there in, in Esther's chapter around you know, what does it mean to embody the white man at both sort of a, a psychological level, but at the physical level. Yeah, strong alpha, uh, believes in law and order, wants a good, like it, at least a baseline uh, pro family environment. You, I mean, everybody in the chat already, for, you know, everybody knows. Um, and there's also a chapter on Wolverine. Low crime, high trust, etc. That, that deals with this in specifically in Frank Miller's um, mini series about Wolverine um, going to Japan and what what that sort of Orientalism how that Orientalism plays into the concept of whiteness. I think Sean um, so, wears a tea cozy you know, in, on his in head. labeling the book Unstable Masks, we're really trying to get at the side, the same assimilation idea that you're talking about earlier, um, where, you know, whiteness has the privilege to put on the masks that it wants, um, but at the same time, always seems somewhat uncomfortable with itself, is always looking for more aspects to assimilate whether it's so why why do you put us in this uncomfortable position where you put us under a microscope like this in the first place you know the awesome samurai-ness that wolverine wants to eat up and sort of add to his you know superhero abilities not that a, a guy with impenetrable body that heals itself and has blades coming out of his hand you know, right, necessarily exactly. need any more skill. Stoic, badass, um, strong. Yeah. Mm. And that yeah, traits that you'll never have, exactly. The same time, you're not you're not of the huet, virile sort of You know, if there if whiteness is stock. a mask, it's a mask that only certain people can put on at certain times. Mm-hmm. You know, and vision is an interesting example because he's a robot. Like ideally he should be able to embody whatever he wants, but yet he's always failing this sort of psychosocial um, failing off, to attain off. the psychosocial level of what? this dude gets paid like four thousand dollars of taxpayer money every single time he says like oh, ha, ha. masculine success mm-hmm. or like you know like like 501c3 non-profit money from some corporation somewhere batman of course Carled right in. batman's a great example of this yeah i knew they were gonna bring up batman because i've heard i've heard leftists talk about this before this idea that batman is like a, oh yeah if, a, if he was a black man doing that then he'd be immediately shot down by the police but it's like well so what he's got bulletproof gadgets right are you i mean are you doubting the are you are you doubting the abilities of black bruce wayne or like <laughs> i mean what the fuck dude exactly dems are the real racists. yeah um, and and in in um, Jeffrey Brown's chapter on Batman, he had, he did with Batman and the the question of coloniality um, and justice, coloniality and how justice. Batman sort of creates mm. this this mm. corporation to extend the very idea of man across multiple nations, and and how does he do it? He does it by choosing people who are going to do exactly what he wants them to do in. Um, the Middle East, in Africa, in Mexico, 
um, in France. And all of these people um, are people who in many ways challenge um, Wait, so is that right? But is that writing in and of itself like more lefty pandering? Like, isn't that more like, hey, look at how evil, like, so so it, is Sean here taking like what we already know of as lefty sort of writing and pandering? And is he saying, oh, that is still reinforcing white supremacy, even though it's like further rubbing people's nose in the it? The classic ideals of American whiteness. Is he that crazy? Which, yeah, Bruce Wayne <laughs> represents. Um, and yet, because Grant Morrison, who's writing um, Batman at the time, is thinking about, you know, this great sort of neoliberal crusade for global justice, he's ignoring the fact that justice That's you guys. looks different for white people and non-white people. Right, yeah, justice to a white person is like, hey, you are you stand accused of X, Y, and Z, let's put you on trial, and if we have evidence to convict you, we do so, and we remove you from society. Uh, non-white justice for the past several months appears to have been just, oh, um, you failed to put the bleak fist up, so we're going to come, like, burn your domicile or business to the ground, or, you know, <laughs> you happen to be in a similar general neighborhood or vicinity where a bleak career criminal was gunned down or whatever by cops, so, uh, well, your private property or personal property is now... A campfire. Um, that seems to be the divergence in what bleak and huate justice means. I mean, one is actual justice and the other is just like savagery. I think that's the main. So di- that's that's you, where it's sort of. You and Martin, as you mentioned at the beginning of our podcast, you know, you had this idea at a coffee shop. You launched into it. Um, I know this was running up to the Trump election. Um, and now here we are, kind of, you know, 2020. Um, what. What if it- so this is before COVID race war? These guys are still whinging. They have no idea. These these people, ten months ten months ago, yeah, they barely even really know anything has what's gonna changed. Happen, um, in I don't know comics and f- sort of fandoms and comics creating that might I don't know maybe trouble or destabilize a little bit this this uh, sort of Whoa. this position of whiteness you just said destabilize i mean are they going to say subvert next trouble destabilize undo um yeah these are a lot of uh <laughs> tribal hostile tribal outgroup uh tea cozy hat words Boy, yeah, that's a great question because it's one that we've wrestled with a lot not just in comics but in you know society generally um and i think that the 2010s will probably be remembered (laughs) as a period that first saw the attempts of fans and creators who were not white guys um, sort of begin to succeed. Nobody wants to watch and read that. The industry. Well, yeah. Um, But they're going to do it by force too, because they're just going to come and again, they're just going to come smash. They're going to spread rumors about a fake pandemic. And I mean, no, it's totally real. You guys. Yeah. Everybody, Everybody's dying off from this bat coof. Um, they're going to spread rumors about that and shutdowns and fear about that, and then they're going to send Antifa through to smash your comp- competing uh, non-paused comic shop. I mean, that's essentially what they're... Means to change, you know, comics. And th- that's what they're preparing for in this podcast. Specifically, um, time will still have to tell because, you know... I think there's a, there's a lot of important pushes for diversity, but the question is, what does diversity mean in a medium that is still, you know, directing capital to this very powerful corporation that is still invested in what sells, right? Oh, you guys are talking about the horror cinematic universe that we never got. We still we we got the fucking DC and Marvel cinematic universes instead. I would have enjoyed if they had continued uh, on the vein of. Uh, Freddy versus Jason, if they'd continued those types of movies versus movies, if they'd been able to secure the rights in some way that they apparently haven't been able to, like Pinhead versus Michael or something, I would have liked that a hell of a lot more than what we've been getting with these stupid fucking, like, DC, whatever, part eight, like Iron Man 87. Like, um, I don't care about that at it all. Justice you know? and equality to, you know, suddenly have. 
um, stupid, a character man. become important only because, for example, in the case of Miss Marvel. Ask these guys why equality is good and watch them just deer in the headlights. I mean, they'll just walk away without saying anything. Um, only or like try to, like, if you have to set a protest, they'll try to get the cops to get you physically removed. And sometimes they'll be successful. Because she sells a lot of copies. It doesn't necessarily mean that the basic you know, the basic structures of power in society have changed for structures? Um, Muslim Americans or Arab Americans or Pakistani Americans. They could but just go home. It means something. There's an idea. And I think the question of what it means diversity to have succeeded in minor ways in the industry um, is still one that's left unanswered because we haven't really seen the full ramifications of this larger media cycle we're in that is just obsessed with superheroes. Um, that's not really a great answer because I'm not sure there are many good answers, but I think we've generally seen that fans and critics and, you know, now the increasing cohort of fans slash critics who are becoming scholars, um, we're seeing that they're Made much us. better readers of race and gender and ethnicity and ability um, and a all lot these of people that need to be put in jail. Than they ever were. A lot we of people that are a lot of people that are being churned out by the universities to effectively just be terrorists at this point. This is, I mean, this is what we know. They're trying to just be like they're trying to just innocently wedge it into like oh superheroes, lightness and superheroes. But it's just one little edging toward training the next generation to be just street terrorists. Or were. Um, and who will enforce things like mask lockdowns and stupid big tech censorship and cancel culture and all this crap. So that's bringing sort of all tied together, a lot of dude. excitement to the way that we talk about comics and about what's possible. You know, maybe in 20 years that will have significantly changed the industry and who makes yeah. up the industry. But, yep. you know, they're I trying to replace you. They're telling you right to your face right now. They're trying to replace you. We'll have to see. Yep. What um you know as we wrap this up, what's a really exciting title for you right now in comics? That is a question I can't actually answer because I'm embarrassed to say I haven't been reading any comics um, that are coming out regularly for about two years, um, largely because a lot of my work has moved away from comics, um, and so much of what I'm reading in comics are graphic novels that. My, my kid needs, um, you know, is reading for school or, or whatnot. Um, so I, a lot of what I've also... So yeah, the kids reading about gra how the whiteness of graphic novels is problematic in school now, probably earlier and earlier, younger and younger. What I've been doing is reading over old things, so I'm trying to work my way through, um, you know, the Tintin series and um, Valerian and Laureline, both French uh, comic series. Okay, uh, Tintin's legit, I um, guess. But Rupan would be a lot cooler. Lupin the third. From what I hear, there's a lot of great stuff happening. I just don't have my finger on the pulse of well, that. Mm -hmm. You're really busy too, trying to finish up your PhD. I know you also edit a, um, your editor um, of a journal, um, among many other things that you do. What what is the sort of next big project for you beyond sort of finishing this dissertation? Well, cleaning my strap on. And yeah, so on. finishing the dissertation, which is on um, the effect of plucking the pubes out of my teeth. On American fiction in the fifties. Um, my boyfriend. I'm also co-writing with Martin. Um, the co-editor for this book, a short introduction to whiteness for MIT Press's Essential Knowledge series. So that'll be a book of roughly 35,000 words that's kind of geared toward a popular audience about, you know, the, the larger question what we're talking about in this book. What is whiteness? How do we think about it? Um, how do we recognize it? How do we grift off of it? And how do we fight it? Um, how do so we a lot fight of it? There we go. the work that I'm doing, especially with Martin. So how do we fight law and order? How do we fight a sense of justice and order and um, safety in our communities? How do we fight against that so we can just undermine the country? How can we get into every single space and make it seem like it's innocuous <clears throat> at first? But, you know, look at this side schnoz. Uh, you can kind of see. Whoops. Maybe you can kind of see. Uh, I don't know. Toward a more general look at whiteness. 
Uh, he and I also co-edit, along with Julia Round, um, a book series for University of Nebraska Press on comics theory. Um, so if anyone listening is interested in, you know, submitting to that, please reach out to us. Um, and just now, this hasn't really been announced yet, um, but in the past few days, uh, we've gotten a contract, um, another scholar, Karen Omri and I, to co-edit a book series for Paul Grave on major science and text. So a lot going on, um, a lot in the editing world, um, but hopefully some more public focused work about, you know, how we deal with these major issues. Well, thank you, Sean, for joining me, Professor Latinx podcast to talk about your co-edited Unstable Masks, Whiteness and American Superhero Comics. Thank you, Sean. Just total grifter parasites. But yeah, back to, I mean, regular everyday Latino or Hispanic Americans, um, you know, this study, if you can, <clears throat> on your own time, you can go through it. I mean, if you research, probably link it in the description later, but shows you that while, you know, a quarter or so, depending on the age demographics, but uh, about a quarter, maybe a little bit more of Latinos in America have heard of the term Latinx, but virtually none of them use it, like 3% of them. Total fucking nonsense, bougie leftist nonsense, trying to scramble your brain, scramble your language, subvert your culture, piece by piece. They've been doing it for years. Um, it's just that they've been really bold about it with the advent of social media being ubiquitous. But yeah, once again, if you've got a video you'd like me to go over, or a podcast, whatever, article, please toss me this, this, this tier here. Uh, DN do has been gracious enough to toss me some support and, uh, I'm glad to go over whatever you want me to go over, however painful it may be. But, um, yeah.